Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here this evening. Nice to get back out in person, to actually be around people. <laughs> Just to make this clear, Chris, this is not a Zoom meeting. It's not a Zoom meeting. Great. It's nice to see friendly faces. <laughs> and uh, my name is Mike Ferguson. I'm the host of the morning show on News Talk STL. Uh, wonderful to work with my friends at the Show Me Institute. Again, I've spent a lot of time. Actually, I used to work for the Show Me Institute uh, with Show Me Opportunity as well. And now here we are with News Talk STL. If you've not checked us out yet, please do. In St. Louis City, we're at 101.9. And uh, if you are in St. Charles County, north and into the Illinois uh, area, it is 94.1, of course, NewstalkSTL.com. And we've got all of the social media sites that, uh, that you can join us on. Facebook, Twitter. I've heard we're on Instagram. My daughter tells me <laughs> I'm not cool enough to be on Instagram. But News Talk STL is uh, out there. So we've got a couple of introductions. There's probably a few people still looking for some parking. Uh, so we'll have a few people trickle in. So a few in introductions for everybody. But I just wanted to, again, say thank you. It's so nice to get out in person. We've got a great night of just thought-provoking conversation. We are going to have a question and answer session um, after this. So uh, when you're listening to, uh, to Douglas, be, be thinking about what you want to uh, hear from him, because we're going to answer as many questions as we possibly can. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to the co-host of our afternoon program, Chris Arps. Thank you, and as Mike said, I am the co-host of the Tim Jones and Chris Arps show. And before we get started, I just want to acknowledge some of the News Talk STL staff that are here. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge the greatest executive producer in radio, Katie Fitzpatrick. I want to also uh, introduce the producer for the uh, Mike Ferguson Morning Show, Ken Williams, back in the back. And then I want to uh, introduce the exceptional management staff at News Talk STL, the one, the brains that had the idea to put together this station. Uh, Jeff Allen's back there. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Joe and Michelle Rush. And also, you know, every station has a voice that when you hear it, you know, you know, that's that particular station. The voice for News Talk STL is the one and only Jim Motlin. Hi, Jim. Good. And so without further ado, uh, I will introduce the uh, president of the, of the Show Me Institute. Once I get my paper out, sorry. Brenda Talent is the CEO of the Show Me Institute, the only think tank in Missouri dedicated to promoting free markets and individual liberty. Before joining the Show Me Institute a little over 10 years ago, Brenda Talent was a tax lawyer. Prior to that, she served as a captain in the United States Army Judge Advocate General Corps and as a commissioner on the Army Court of Military Review. Uh, Talent has lived in Missouri for over 30 years. Her husband is Jim Talent, a former U.S. Senator and Congressman, and I was proud to say that I was a staffer for Senator Talent at one time. And rumor has it, and I don't think it's a rumor, is that she was the one who ran his first campaign for Congress. Brenda's passion is for Missouri to be a light of freedom and prosperity among other states. Brenda Talent. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, the Show Me Institute is so pleased to partner with National Review Institute, with News Talk, STL, and Show Me Opportunity to bring you this program tonight. Um, I see many faces that know about the Show Me Institute, but if you don't, we are an independent research and education organization. We focus on Missouri fiscal and economic policies from a free market lens. Uh, we don't believe that more government is the solution to every problem facing our citizens. Instead, we promote solutions that really try to empower people to, to, to tap into their creativity, their individuality, to solve the problems facing our state. Please learn more about us at showmeinstitute.org, on Facebook at Show Me Institute, or on Twitter at Show Me. And we do have materials right over there, which you can pick up. And if you'd like to learn more, we have cards that you can fill out, so I'd encourage you to do that. So now I turn to my main 
uh, job for this, this evening, and that is to introduce you to Chris Ciencimino. Chris is the Director of Regional Development and National Review Institute. In this role, he's responsible for managing relationships with the National Review Institute friends and donors, um, all in the Midwest. He's in a, he came to town from Milwaukee, where he lives with his wife, two daughters, two dogs, and two cats, and rumor has it <clears throat> that he's a Brewers fan. But we'll try not to hold that against him. So Chris, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Brenda. It's a true, it's not just a rumor, it's true. And we went out with a whimper, but I think we lost to the eventual champion, so at least I can take some solace in that. Um, like Brenda said, my name is Chris Ansamino. I'm Director of Regional Development for National Review Institute. I typically go on way too long with these things, so I'm gonna read right from my script, and I apologize. First, Brenda, I wanna thank you and your absolutely fantastic staff who's here for bringing us all together. Um, thanks to News Talk STL for co-hosting this and promoting it. I was, came into town yesterday, I heard it on the radio, and I heard there was going to be a great crowd, which is news to me, and I was thrilled that, um, that it was, it's turning out that way. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, uh, so nice to see a lot of people that I, I know and making, looking forward to making some new friends while I'm here. Um, National Review Institute, if you are not familiar, is a, the nonprofit organization founded by William F. Buckley, Jr. to support the editorial mission of National Review Magazine. Today we strive to preserve and promote the legacy of William F. Buckley Jr. and we do that by supporting um, some of the top talent at National Review and also by building programs that support their work. And we're expanding the kinds of programs that we have so that we can support other aspects of Bill Buckley's legacy to the millions of Americans that, whether they're familiar with Bill Buckley or not, have been touched by the conservative principles he championed and the movement he spearheaded. One example, for instance, is our new National Review Capital Matters project, which champions unabashedly capitalism. This new section in National Review Magazine features articles on economics, finance, and policy analysis, and is done from a strictly pro-business, pro-free market perspective, with what we call a National Review sensibility. You won't find any headlines in Capital Matters about the failures of capitalism or the term fair share. While there are plenty of business sites out there, as you know, very few, with the possible exception of the WSJ editorial page, offer this unapologetic perspective. Even that's maybe debatable these days. National Review's online platform reaches over six million readers a month, and with National Review Institute's support, it is able to continue expanding this section to our growing audience. We do have some swag and some magazines back there, so if you pick up a National Review magazine, you'll see Capital Matters section. I didn't put it in my remarks, but you can visit nrinstitute.org to learn more information about what we do in our programming. Another example of some of our programming expansion is what we call our Burke to Buckley program, an eight-session dinner discussion series for mid-career professionals. This program explores the foundations of conservative thought and builds a network of talented individuals who wish to engage in a rigorous examination of conservative principles and how they apply to the issues of the day. Incorporating readings from Burke to Buckley, as you get, as you can expect, participants discuss the readings each week with a le leading conservative thinker. Currently operating in Dallas, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia, we are pleased to be expanding this program to Miami this spring. If you happen to know anyone in any of those cities that would like to participate, please have them visit our website. Those are just two simple ways that National Review Institute works to amplify the work of the magazine and promote our top writers beyond those pages. And speaking of our top writers, which gets me to my key job tonight, we are so pleased to have one of them with us tonight in Douglas Murray. Douglas is a best-selling author, an award-winning political commentator, and a senior fellow at National Review Institute. He has written books on terrorism and national security, freedom of speech, Douglas's latest book, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race, and Identity, which I see several copies of tonight. I see some people got it autographed, very well done. Investigates the rise of woke culture and identity politics. He is associate editor of The Spectator, which if I have my history correct, is the oldest weekly magazine in the world, and a Fox News contributor. His new book, The War on the West, is coming out this April, and you can pre-order that now. It will inform some of his talk tonight. We are so pleased to have him stateside with us tonight. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Douglas Murray. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what a great pleasure it is uh, to be in this fine city and to see all of you here tonight. It's a real pleasure. It's my first time here. And I should uh, thank uh, the Show Me Institute, uh, the National Review Institute, and News Talk STL for uh, arranging this evening. And I'm really looking forward to Mike and Chris, um, who I, I, I don't know if we're having some questions before we go to you, or whether the plan is that they are here to protect me from you in some way. <laughs> we'll have to see. But um, I, I really am up for any questions you want to ask on anything I mention in my remarks, and, and anything I don't as well. Please feel free to, to when we get to Q&A, ask whatever you like, because it's a bit I really enjoy. Um, let me just say, also, it's um, a particular thrill to be in St. Louis, because um, St. Louis was the birthplace and home of a man who completely changed my life. Um, and I've spent part of today uh, on the trail of him. Uh, that man is T.S. Eliot. Um, I went uh, this morning to Locust Street to see the, the place where he was born and spent his childhood years, and, and then uh, to Westminster, which is a more salubrious street these days than Locust Street, and um, <laughs> um, without making any slight against the fine residents of Locust Street, uh, <laughs> who doubtless are all here tonight and are going to speak in the Q&A. Um, but I wanted to mention him because uh, the reason he changed my life was the same reason that he changed the life of one of my great friends and mentors, uh, the late Roger Scruton. Um, Roger wrote in his memoir, in his own memoirs, uh, Gentle Regrets, that T.S. Eliot had saved him from Oswald Spengler. Uh, let me just tease out what that means. Uh, Spengler wrote the a very famous work in the uh, 19-teens called The Decline of the West. And this saw Western decline as effectively inevitable for reasons that Spengler lays out at enormous length. And it's extraordinarily searing and intense work, which swept a lot of people along, including the young Roger Scruton. And uh, Roger says in, in Gentle Regrets that, that it was T.S. Eliot who saved him from Spenglerism. And I had exactly the same experience, not just with Spengler, but with other writers as well. What is it that made T.S. Eliot able to have this influence and have, have this influence still? Um, if I was to nail it down to one thing, it isn't just his extraordinary insight into the possibility of the regaining of time, which is a concept which I could go on about all night. It's, it's about something else. It's about the possibility of cultural revival. It's the possibility that things that are dead can be reborn. Things that seem to be lost can be found. Just because something has gone for a period, sometimes of millennia, does not mean they're lost forever. Uh, there are quotations he gives in his works, particularly in The Wasteland, uh, which uh, from, for instance, from Dante. If you meet any student at any Western university and ask them to tell you something about Dante, the most likely thing is they know about Dante because of T.S. Eliot. So a man born in St. Louis has, in our own day, led students back to a Florentine poet from the 15th century. And that's a remarkable thing, not just because it demonstrates that's possible in literature. It demonstrates that it's possible across the wider culture the possibility of revival, revivic re revivification of the culture. Now, um, this slightly cheekily titled talk, Reflections on the Revolution in America, is, of course, referring to a work which, uh, by the, somebody who was just mentioned, Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke, the, the, now regarded as perhaps the greatest foundational philosopher of conservatism, um, was in his day perhaps not really regarded so much as a philosopher. He was a parliamentarian and a pamphleteer and much more, but his uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France, another searing work, um, had one intention in particular, uh, not to simplify this work. It was to do this thing. It was to cut Britain off from the influence of revolutionary France. After 1789, 
thinkers like Burke, parliamentarians like Burke, patriots like Burke in my country of birth, were horrified by what they saw across the channel. This was, if you like, an early form of uh, socialism. It was an early form of Marxism. It was pre-Marx Marxism. Uh, the slogans of the revolution in France were all the slogans that you can hear today about uh, equality and fraternity. And uh, Edmund Burke was not the first. Well, he was one of the first, but he was certainly the most perceptive to recognize that the people talking about equality did not seem to be very good at it in practice. <laughs> and there was an awful lack of fraternalism when they got to the terror. <laughs> and Burke's insight, apart from anything else, and one of the things that makes him a conservative philosopher is that he had this instinct that sometimes drove him to excess in the reflections in the revolutions in France. He ends up in one passage famously uh, not just defending, but revering Marie Antoinette, which in historical terms is, is, is a dubious proposition. She, she, she has good critics. Um, but, but he does this, why? Because his instinct is that whatever the status quo was, whatever its downsides, everything that the revolutionaries were planning was going to be a hell of a lot worse. And he was right. He foresees everything that's going to come next. There's a wonderful moment in Hilary Mantel's novel on the French Revolution, a place of greater safety, where the revolutionaries are in the parliament trying to debate uh, their rights that they're going to now acquire. They're so thrilled about the rights they're going to have. And Hilary Mantel has a great moment where she says, some people in the council wanted to talk of laws, but that was a less exciting proposition. So that was put off for another day. Yeah. Um, so Burke in his day was trying to cut England off from the influence of revolutionary France. And he was one of a huge number of people who had an effect to help make that possible. One of the reasons I chose this title, uh, uh, slightly cheeky title for the talk tonight, is because something slightly similar is happening in our own time. And it's something which as a lifelong admirer, lover of America, saddens me enormously, which is that there is now a global attempt around the world, particularly in the West, for countries to cut themselves off from America, and specifically from American culture. This, by the way, is a new thing. I've written quite often in the past about bad thought ideas that have permeated from my side of the Atlantic to this side of the Atlantic. And uh, hands up, there's no shortage of them particularly from France, I should say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but to a great extent, you know, America has imported some terrible ideas from the European continent. Uh, today, something extraordinary is happening. Uh, countries across Western Europe, across the whole of Europe, my own country, trying to cut themselves off from the influence of American culture as it now is. In France, this is perhaps most developed. French academics recently joined together to sign a declaration which in France really matters. Uh, they signed this, this joint letter saying that we mustn't allow the importing of American academic culture to our country. We must keep it out. Uh, the president of the republic, the, uh, President Macron, who's not a man of the right, uh, sort of squidgy center somewhere, um, uh, President Macron has said the same thing. We want to cut ourselves off from these cultural imports coming in from America. That is a quite extraordinary thing to have and to be hearing from uh, the French president and from s senior thinkers and philosophers across France. Why are they doing it? It's the same reason that, that the, my own country of birth, Great Britain, this is happening to some degree. It's because people are realizing that there is some terrible thought disease that has been coming out of this country, which works hideously in this country and is highly unlikely to be working around the rest of the world. Um, so having given you some bad ideas, you seem to be giving us some back. Now, what is the revolution? Some people say it's the media. And I could go on all night about the nature of the media and what's been going wrong in this country and other countries in the West. 
the media, which I've spent my life in, is, um, is riven with troubles these days. You, by the way, have some troubles that we don't have back home. Some of us were talking about this over dinner last night. In Britain, we have a very strong right of center print media. Um, I noticed that can't be said in the US or indeed in this state. <coughs> um, uh, but uh, it, there is definitely a problem in our era of people uh, effectively bifurcating. We absorb different media, we absorb different opinions, absorb different news. And then there's this follow-on from that that's got so much worse in American culture in recent years. Something I noticed last year when I was covering the election and went through only about 10 states or so, but I noticed it very close up and wrote about this in National Review, among other places. You noticed that uh, people now had their own facts um, and just couldn't agree on things that had happened. Uh, I, I was wondering, having not at that point been in the US for a couple of years, I was wondering why whenever I sat down at an American <coughs> dinner table when I was invited, uh, why I would find that people would just row furiously with each other. Um, uh, families, friends, former friends, everyone was falling out over everything. And I realized that one of the fundamental things is that we couldn't agree on things that had happened. I, I realized that um, many people I was with couldn't agree that Donald Trump had won the last election, the 2016 election. They just didn't think he had. Uh, then we had the added problem after the last election of another part of the population saying that the, that election had gone the other way. So if you can't agree on who wins elections, you're in real trouble. I mean, you're in real trouble. Not least because one of the great things about losing elections, <laughs> and I say this um, having uh, many friends who've lost many elections in many countries, one of the great things about losing an election is that when you lose, you need to work out why you've lost and try to win next time. And I mean, the fact that the Democrats spent four years not working out why they lost in 2016 and pretending it was because of a Russian bot was their loss, but it was also America's loss, I think. And the same thing is at risk with the Republican Party, I have to say. I think that there is a great risk that if, uh, if there can't be a real reckoning with how this happened and a sorting out of it, this isn't going to get any better. Now, all of that can be said about the media, about echo chambers, about uh, um, the loops that people are in, the positive feedback loops that people are in. But that seems to me not to be the absolute center of what is going on in this country that's so difficult at the moment. The central thing that's going on in this country at the moment that's so difficult, it seems to me, is this. It is that there has emerged a very fundamental attempt to rewrite the story of America, to entirely reframe the history of this great nation. Uh, and I want to give just four examples of where I see this really clear in uh, just the last couple of years. And I'm going to refer to direct quotes just so that I don't get any of this wrong. The first, you'll be unsurprised perhaps to hear, is the 1619 project launched by the New York Times. This, by the way, is an example not just of an attempt to rewrite history, but an extraordinary intervention by a newspaper. Uh, for a newspaper to decide to change the founding state, the founding date of the state they're in, is a thing I, I, I can't think of in any previous era as being even imagined to be the role of a newspaper. Uh, you're meant to report the sports, you're meant to report the news, you're not meant to rewrite history. But this was a stated aim of the New York Times when they launched the 1619 Project. They said, and I'm quoting, the 1619 Project is a major initiative from the New York Times observing the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery. It aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 is our true founding and placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. Now, um, they've been rather weaselly about this since um, because a lot of people said you said that you're actually reframing the dates of our true founding. You're saying we were truly founded in 1619. Um, the New York Times since has quietly, silently edited its website. So that little bit is not in there at the moment. 
So then you say, we didn't say that. Well, you don't say it at the moment, but you did say that. Um, this, uh, the the, uh, the non-historian who was hired by the New York Times to lead this project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, has no training as a historian, is not respected as a historian, is a very strange person to hire as a historian. It's like hiring me to run your local basketball team. I mean, <laughs> you could, it's just strange. Um, um, she said, uh, um, she said that making this claim about uh, 1619 being our true founding is the purpose of it. She said, uh, the 1619 project does not argue that 1619 is our true founding, uh, and, uh, and was just caught out immediately afterwards because her own editor at the New York Times said the following. He said, Jake Silverstein, we sort of proposed the idea in a variety of ways that if you consider 1619 as the founding date of the country rather than 1776, it just changes your understanding and we call that a reframing of American history, like you're moving the whole picture over to a new center point. They now say, we never said we're trying to reframe the history of the country. They are. They stated it repeatedly until people caught up with them. And then they said that wasn't what they were doing. Number two the complete rewriting of the Founding Fathers. It's uh, just astonishing to me, I was saying this to a friend last night, uh, um, that uh, routinely, it happened again the other week, a statue of Thomas Jefferson has to be hidden at an American university. It has to be removed, uh, put inside into, as it were, a safe space for the statue. I, I'm, um, I w went around um, uh, Portland, Oregon, um, uh, for the purposes of disaster tourism, really, um, <laughs> last, uh, last October ahead of the uh, election. And, and to Seattle, which by the way is a very, very sad sight these days. Gosh, that used to be a beautiful city. Gosh, it used to be a beautiful city. And wow, is it a dump now. Uh, they have just wrecked that city. Um, and I was going around Portland, Oregon, and they had by then, the, just as I got there, they took down the last statue. It was a statue of Lincoln. Um, so I said to the friend who was showing me around, I, I, I said, um, the only opportunities for tourism in Portland going forward is if anyone's really interested in empty plinths. <laughs> if, if you're into empty plinths, it's a fine vista in Portland. You can just get empty plinth after empty plinth. If you're interested in statues, there's nothing to see. Uh, but this, this, we were told when this outburst of iconoclasm began, we were told that this was just Confederate monuments. And there were arguments about that. But wow, in no time did it move straight to the Founding Fathers, straight to Lincoln, straight to every major figure in American history. Let me give you another example of the same. This is Independence Day last year. Um, this was uh, just ahead of the President's speech at Mount Rushmore. When you remember, President Trump tried, I thought, rather, um, rather well to sort of reclaim the narrative and say, no, I'm going to tell you about who the four, four remarkable men behind me are. Uh, this was how CNN's correspondent reacted when CNN went live to Mount Rushmore. Uh, Leila Santiago described the upcoming events. She said, kicking off the Independence Day weekend, President Trump will be at Mount Rushmore, where he'll be standing in front of a monument of two slave owners on land wrestled away from Native Americans. <laughs> and again, you don't have to go back very many years to wonder when Mount Rushmore would have been described so blithely in such terms. It's a very new thing. Even 10 years ago, I think we could have got a majority of Americans to recognize this is a very strange way to describe that particular national monument. Now, the fourth example I wanted to give on this is perhaps the most dangerous and divisive of all, and that is what's become known as CRT, or critical race theory, or whiteness studies. This is, I warn you from the outside, one of the most toxic ways in which you can blow up a society. Um, uh, the deracialization of politics, culture, and everything else, colorblindness, as it was called until 
an academic from Duke University, said that color blindness was itself racist. Um, this is absolute deadly. Uh, the moment you try to teach children that they are of any racial background, that they are in any way evil or bad or complicit or anything else, simply because of the color of their skin, whatever group of people you did that to, you are poisoning the minds of those children. You are wrecking the perspective they're going to have in their lives. And you are going to profoundly and negatively influence everything in the world around them. Because they are going to, instead of taking race out of every opportunity, they are going to be putting it in at every opportunity, because that's what they've been taught to do. Um, now, if you were to steel man this argument. We all know what straw manning an argument is. But if you were to steel man the argument of what I've just described, it would be you would say, well, America is going through a correction, that there wasn't enough attention in the past to racism, that there wasn't enough attention in the past to slavery, there wasn't enough attention in the past to injustice, and there wasn't enough attention to bad things that happened in American history. Uh, it's a similar argument that you hear on the other side of the Atlantic about post-colonialism. They say, well, there hasn't been enough uh, study of the colonial period's downsides. There hasn't been enough uh, looking at the bad side of empire. By the way, I recently, uh, for my next book, I, I studied quite a lot of American textbooks. And this, this is completely wrong already. Uh, American school children are already taught about these things. Uh, they are not being non-informed about aspects of this country's history. That, like every country's history, they need to know about. But it isn't the case that this is hidden knowledge. It's not the case that America never addressed the issue of slavery. It was addressed in a very big way, in a very prominent war two centuries ago, that is studied by every American school child. And uh, so I find this claim that this is merely a correction to be fallacious. What, if, what I think is going on is that we are in the midst of what I described in a different context in the manners of crowds as an overcorrection. This is quite common in our era, by the way. The overcorrection relies, apart from anything else, on um, not just justice, but the moment at which justice swings into what Nietzsche describes as revenge. Um, it can happen in politics, and it can happen from any direction in politics. Uh, you want to correct what your political opponents have done, but sometimes also that ugly human instinct to also kick them in the shins comes in. And we all have it, and we're all lying if we don't. But the overcorrection revels in that place. I described in The Madness of Crowds four overcorrections in relation to social issues, uh, sexual issues, and more where I think uh, you know, when you hear feminists talking about men as if, like, men have no good thing to be said about them, you know you're in an overcorrection. <laughs> <laughs> you can be pretty confident that you're in an overcorrection then. And you think, okay, then nah, you can criticize men a bit, but there must be something we can do right. Um, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of other areas in social issues where the same, that same ugly instinct has come in. But the most dangerous one is where it comes in by reevaluating your entire history. And let me give you uh, um, a couple of examples of where that has happened in uh, recent times in America. Um, and I'm going to use just one, uh, exam one uh, media organization as an example of, of where this has, I think, gone wrong. Because I think what has gone wrong is not an understanding of the American past that is wrong, but a misperception of the American present. And I'm going to get on to exactly why that is. But let me just first give you some of the, the, the facts of how I think this has come about. It's a lethal thing when you fail to accurately understand the world around you and the society around you. And that, to a great extent, and indeed provably, as I'm going to show you, is where America is at the moment, on a range of the most dangerous, tricky issues. Um, everybody here well knows the situation that occurred in Ferguson. Um, everybody knows the way in which the press reported it at the time. 
and everybody knows how much little coverage there was when some of the facts finally came out about exactly what had happened there. And it was a different story. Now, some of the media had the good grace and the honesty to admit uh, that they'd got it wrong. One such paper was the Washington Post. They actually, they actually ran the story of saying that uh, Michael Brown had, had, had not shouted, hands up, don't shoot, and had not been unarmed much more. By the way, an example of the way in which this stuff spills over these days, I went to the first BLM protest in London in 2014, 2015, uh, observing it as a journalist. And if you'll pardon the levity about what is a serious subject, but um, the protesters in London, about a thousand of them were marching down Oxford Street with their hands up in the air, saying, hands up, don't shoot, accompanied by unarmed British police officers <laughs> who, who couldn't have shot them if they'd wanted to. Uh, we, we don't have an armed constabulary. So, so I watched this with an element of wryness. But the Washington Post did have the decency to correct the record, which not every paper did, I can assure you. Um, but even a paper like the Washington Post, once venerable, uh, is not immune from introducing insane contact, concepts into the body politic. After the election uh, last year, uh, it's just after the election in November, when whatever else had happened, Donald Trump had very demonstrably increased the share of the vote for the Republican Party among black men in this country, among uh, Hispanics, uh, and other groups. And had, of course, very interestingly, declined among uh, certain portions of the white uh, communities in the US. Now, uh, again, as, a, as an analyst of these things, there are all sorts of interesting things to be said about that. As a partisan, you could play all sorts of games around that from both sides. But what did the Washington Post do? It decided to do what so many people in this country do now. And it decided to completely miss the point. <laughs> the Washington Post decided to look at these facts of the Republican share of the vote among ethnic minorities rising and come up with a term. You can't do this with a straight face. <laughs> Multiracial whiteness. Multiracial whiteness is when you're not white, but you behave as if you are by voting for the Republicans. <laughs> and this is, um, I mean, there is so there's a, as, as I think, as somebody says of Basil Fawlty in Fawlty Towers, the, psych <laughs> the psychiatrist says of him, remember, he says, there's a whole conference in that one. <laughs> there is a whole conference in the concept of multiracial whiteness, rather than, this is fascinating that this group, of, this group of people who are historically more voting that way are now voting more that way. That's what a journalist would do. You'd just be looking at what the facts are. That's fascinating. But no, it's coming up with these very strange theories. Now, on a more serious note, what does this mean when you end up uh, uh, miss representing your society so much that people actually have uh, a totally false, wildly off understanding of their society. You get to the situation we're now provably in, in America. And let me just zone in on that. The most uncomfortable conversation in America, uh, police shootings involving black Americans. Uh, actual public understanding of this issue is wildly and provably out of sync with reality. Um, when US citizens were polled recently and asked how many unarmed black Americans they believe are shot by police in a year, the year in question selected was 2019, when Americans were asked how many unarmed black Americans they believe were shot by the police in 2019, the numbers were out by several orders of magnitude. Several orders of magnitude. Among people who described themselves as, quote, very liberal, 
22% of those people said that they thought that the American police shot about, or more than, 10,000 unarmed black men that year. <laughs> about or more than 10,000 black men in a year. And now, among self-identified liberals, that's not very liberals, liberals, 40% thought that the figure was somewhere between 1,000 and over 10,000. The actual figure was somewhere around 10. And that's a terrible fact. It's a terrible fact on its own. But it means that the public perception is wildly out of kilter with the reality. By the way, by proportion, it is the case that unarmed black Americans are slightly more likely to be shot by the police than unarmed white Americans. But as it also happens, uh, figures, again compiled by the Washington Post Police Shootings Database, confirms that in the years before the death of George Floyd, more police officers were killed by black Americans than unarmed black Americans were killed by the American police. And these are, these are very difficult corners. But here's what I think has been happening, and I wrote about this in National Review recently. What has been happening is something like the effect when you have a magic lantern. One of the reasons why America fights so intricately on these cases is that what happens here matters. And what happens in cases like this matters. And if you just minutely alter the reality in the country, when it's America, what is projected onto the wall of the world is a vast misrepresentation. You only need to tweak a little bit to the source of what you're projecting, when it's America you're projecting. If it was Luxembourg or somewhere else, it would be different. <laughs> this is America. <laughs> what is projected when you change it even slightly, when America is projected on the wall, shows a whole different beast. And we have on top of that the fact that in the COVID era, we were all confined to our houses, and many people genuinely were wondering is the thing I am being shown actually the society I'm in? Are we like that? Maybe we are. I don't know. I haven't been allowed out of the house for the last three months. <laughs> Anything could have happened. But this has just made things infinitely worse in our era. So I've got, I'm going to wrap up. And I just wanted to wrap up by saying these things. Um, we have to find some way to get back to shore. Uh, in America, uh, and I say that, as I say, for the sake of, I think, the whole West, not just this country. I have several uh, suggestions. I'm not going to linger over them. I write about them in the forthcoming book, but let me just throw out a couple before questions and answers. Um, the first is, we're going to have to find some things to agree on in this country. Just going to have to find some things to agree on. It could be facts. It could be agreed history. <laughs> it could be agreed heroes. It could just be agreeing on an event that just happened. But there has to be some way to find ourselves once again agreeing on what has happened and shutting as much as we can this alternative reality which we found ourselves stuck in. Second thing and I could linger on this all night, but I promise I won't, is just to look at the damn alternatives. You know, I see this so clearly from outside this country. I, before COVID, I was usually in a different country every week. Now I'm just in a different state every week. But I used to be in a different country every week. And I've been to many countries in the world and many beleaguered places. And I can tell you, any young American who complains about their lot in America may well complain about their lot, but they honestly should go anywhere else in the world anywhere else. And, and so much could just be improved by realizing your goddamn luck and being grateful for it. So I'm here because uh, this is, to my mind, the place where all this matters. I like Britain. There are lots of places I like. I like Greece. 
uh, like Italy. But there's not much of interest happening. <laughs> That's terrible. I'm going to lose all my Greek and Italian friends. Um, but the, what happens here does matter. And if you get this century wrong, wow, the rest of the world goes wrong. If you get it right, the rest of this century and more can go very well indeed. And cities like this one can restore themselves to former glories and go better. Um, things go the other way, everything goes south. So to quote the um, son of this city who I started off from, he describes the still point of the turning world. That's something like what we're in. Maybe the noisy point of the still turning world. Anyhow. Thank you. Douglas, thank you very much. Uh, what we're going to do now is we've got not quite 15 minutes. We're going to do a question and answer session. And one of the things that tends to happen at things like this is somebody, before they ask a question, make their own speech. Uh, we want to get as many questions as we can, so what we'll do is Chris Arps up uh, front and I will go back and forth uh, between the front and the back to get everybody, uh, everybody we can uh, a chance to ask a question, but please go right to the point of the question. But before we do that, uh, I missed somebody. Chris, we missed somebody earlier. The, uh, the most popular weekend host in St. Louis radio history is Mr. Randy Tobler. <laughs> And he got in, and I didn't realize it. So great to see you, doctor. And uh, with that, uh, Chris, uh, if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand. Chris, you pick somebody at random up front, and then I'll go from here. And again, please go right to the question, and we'll get as many exchanges as we can in as possible. We've got this uh, young man right here. Uh, you said that the program was to rewrite the history of America, and I thought you said you had four points. So I got the New York Times with the 1619 Project, rewriting the Founding Fathers and the CRT and whiteness. Did I miss one? And Independence Day, Independence Day as it were, the post-Founding Fathers. In so that even, even Lincoln, okay. you know. Because that's where they started off. They started off with, you know, it's only these people, then it's only these people, then it's, you know, and then on and on. So there's no one left. I mean, literally no one left other than couple of ignoramuses working today. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for setting the standards of uh, argument and, uh, and hope. One of the most effective things is getting more good jokes to criticize. And the issue is how to dramatically improve the jokes that spread like wildfire. I'm hoping you've got one for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, humor is enormously uh, effective. It is, it, it, I, I occasionally use it in hostile crowds because um, if you, not this is a hostile crowd, I hope, but um, <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, uh, but uh, I usually use it in hostile crowds because if you make people laugh at a thing, there's, there, you've, sort of, you've got them to admit something. It, it's, very, it's very interesting. In, when I did my book on um, on uh, the European migration crisis called The Strange Death of Europe. Uh, I had one, um, I had a really tough audience once in Scandinavia, and the, the Scandinavian church archbishop had written a book called Jesus uh, Was a Migrant. Um, and, and, and this was why he said that the southern borders in Europe, ring any bells, um, should, uh, should be open. And I remember I had this very, very hostile audience in, in, um, in Sweden. And uh, I said, uh, and somebody said, you know, Jesus was a migrant. And I said, well, you've you got to be careful with that argument, because he also went back to where he came from. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I felt the audience kind of laugh, then gasp, and then be <laughs> And then they were horrified at themselves. They were just horrified at themselves. <laughs> so you're right, it can be effective. Quick question. As a non-American omniscient narrator or observer of what's going on in this country, does this not seem to you like either the best or the worst Monty Python skit? We've got a president who got elected by hiding in a basement and not telling anybody what he believed, 
who got elected, who has a vice president who's invisible, who has a four-star transgender, yes, first transgender one, who has an energy secretary who laughs about reducing the prices of it. I mean, how do you get back to a centrist view yes. when you've got the, the gong show going on in, in, uh, and, and they're leading this country? The, um, you're right that it becomes hard. I actually have a friend, who, she's a historian, a very fine historian, who also writes novels, satire, very funny satirical novels, called Ruth Dudley Edwards. And she was trying to do one on, she sets them in various institutions. And uh, she was going to, she's been trying to do one in recent years on, um, she even managed to do modern art, by the way. I mean, that's hard to satirize. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she tried to do one set in a campus, and she just gave up. She just gave up. There was just no way you could do a satire set on a campus, because you sit down at your desk in the morning, and they've done something madder than you can imagine. And, and we do, we do. I mean, when I saw that CIA recruitment video a little while ago, I'm sure you all know the one I'm referring to. Uh, and I can't, what was it that the woman said? She said, um, I'm, uh, she talked about her background and her racial identity, her sexual identity. She said she had various um, uh, psychiatric disorders. And you go, yeah, I mean, I hope you're not in charge of the drone program. I, uh, I, uh, it would be good if it was taken out of your hands if you are. Um, but I mean, I'm all for destigmatizing mental health problems. But I mean, we're in a very weird realm when the CIA is actively recruiting people who are mentally ill <laughs> and bro boasting about it. And, and uh, I can't remember the, 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 uh, the one the other week, the, uh, the first, what was it, the first openly transgender admiral. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 said, I said that one of, the great one of the great things about that phrase was it suggested that in the past there were a lot of secret transgender <laughs> admirals, <laughs> right? Like Midway was entirely run by <laughs> secret transgender admirals. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yes, it, it, it's, it's beyond, I don't, know how, I don't know how a satirist can operate these days. Douglas, if I could just follow up on what he said regarding things to, to joke about, could you give your assessment and viewpoint of what we call cancel culture now, where you may not run afoul of the law, but uh, you can run afoul of a mob that wants, wants corporations in the private sector to, to end your career and ostracize you, and then I know we have a question in the middle here. And we've got one here. Um, I'm not a great fan of the phrase cancel culture. I'll tell you why. I'm not a great fan of whinging. Uh, it's a, maybe it's a British thing. Um, I don't know. I don't like whining and belly aching. And when people say, oh, I've been canceled, I fear it's got too much of that. Um, uh, most of the time, I'm now I, I speak from a very privileged, I'm confessing my privilege. <laughs> I speak from a very privileged position in that I've been a writer all my life. And I can say what I want. It's wonderful, by the way. Um, uh, I recognize that a lot of people in their places of work do not have that privilege. And that, that really is a privilege. Now, my hope is that in sector after sector, it becomes easier. Uh, the evidence in recent years, it's become harder and harder. Uh, we had uh, a man in the UK who worked in the supermarket, Asda, who was fired for a Facebook video he shared from the hilarious Scottish comedian Billy Connolly making a joke about Islam. And uh, I think it's outrageous that a joke should be made by our best loved, most foul mouthed comedian. And he gets millions of pounds for doing it. And this supermarket worker gets fired for sharing it. And that's completely unjust. And it's those cases I worry about more in a way. I think the ones that are f sort of famous, I mean, like JK Rowling hasn't been cancelled. You couldn't cancel J.K. Rowling. You can't like, get rid of Harry Potter. That's, it's never, it's, it's, she's been horribly attacked and, and horribly defamed by ghoulish people. Um, but she, she's, she's not destroyed, you know. There are people who have been, and, and senior people, like there's a boss at KPMG, one of the partners, who said in a meeting, he's from Australia. God, I love the Australians. He said, uh, he said in this meeting, uh, CRT is a crock of... You know. Uh, now, that you may say that that was um, firm talk, but it was not untrue. In fact, I can prove it's true. Um, but he was, he was fired. He was fired. He was a partner at that. 
huge firm. So that is real, and it's a big problem. Uh, but it has to be pushed back against, and I want it to be pushed back by a bit of civic courage. And that's what I always encourage. I think people can do it. I think we can all do it. Everyone in their lives can do it. You just speak up a little bit more. If everyone, it, you know, it doesn't require kamikaze acts of bravery by people. I really not, I'm not urging that. If anyone writes to me tomorrow and says, <laughs> I told my boss what I thought of, you know. <laughs> I reiterate, no kamikaze moves. Or at least I'm not liable. Um, but if everyone just took a bit of a step forward, just a bit of a step forward, with their friends, with their family, with their colleagues, make things a hell of a lot easier. All the polls show this strange thing in America, as in Britain, that the public believe one thing, and everything you're meant to say is another. And by the way, sorry, very quickly, uh, because there was a segue from the comedian point, we've got to pay tribute to the fact that American comedians have all become sermonizers. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, when did that happen? I wrote recently in National Review about John Oliver. I mean, it's like watching the court jester shoved into a cassock and put in the pulpit and giving you a sermon every damn <laughs> Sunday morning. And so unfunny. And so lacking in perception or originality or anything else. Just a boring lecture of regurgitated third grade pap. And people call this comedy? <laughs> Honestly. Um, I'm still trying to learn the language. I was at the eye doctor yesterday, and I saw a mask that said she, they. And I didn't know how one person can be a they. I'm still trying to figure that out. That's not my question. Um, my wife and I have been talked uh, numerous times about what, when would you like to be alive now? and we want to go back to the 50s. So my question to you is, are we better off post World Wide Web or pre World Wide Web as a society? Well, that's a, that's a great question. By the way, the, the, um, the, uh, the she, her, they, them, uh, I say the look at me people. Um, the, the, um, I, uh, I, I have a new one, which is if somebody says uh, pronouns in bio, I say chromosomes in bio. Um, <laughs> And um, <laughs> took a beat, <laughs> um, but it's a very effective thing. Say, well, I'll tell you my chromosomes if you like. If you can't guess them, um, but no, uh, um, I'm. Look, this is just the greatest time to be alive. Um, first of all, the fifties. It depends when you were, if you want to be born in the fifties live in the 50s. If you live in the 50s, you have to live through the 40s. Um, my late friend Clive James, a wonderful Australian polymath, um, once said to me towards the end of his life, he was born in 1939. The opening of his first volume of memoirs, uh, unreliable memoirs, memorably begins, I was born in 1939. The other main event that year... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but Clive was just heaven. Uh, and he once said to me, he said, you know, he died a few years ago, he said, Douglas, he said, have you ever seen that Buster Keaton movie where Buster Keaton is standing in the doorway of the house, do you know, in front of the house? And the house starts to collapse. And it turns out to be a stage set house. Do you remember? And it comes down, but it's a brilliant trick. And the whole thing comes down like this. And it, it misses him and he stays standing. And Clive said to me, it was so moving, he said, Douglas, I was born in 1939. And that was my generation. We were Buster Keaton. He said, the whole damn house fell in, and it missed us. Well, that's true. That's true. We have time for one more question, I believe. Was it right here? Yeah, education in America is sort of a closed culture, not only in elementary and secondary, as far as teachers. You have to be certified. You have to join the union, whatever. And, and I think a lot of the things that, that are coming out of those elementary and secondary liberal teachers is what's you know, f formulating these issues that we're talking about. A any insight on education in America as far as how to, to turn that back? You've got, you got, you got to focus on the basics. Yeah. You know, in the, in the early 2010s when the Conservative coalition government came in the UK, we had a Big drive, very impressive drive to open what we call free schools, which is where um, 
children, of, they have, well, as it were, a pot of money. I mean, you have something similar in some states here, and the pot of money follows them whichever school they go to. And, you know, parents overwhelmingly want their children to go to schools with strict standards, strict rules. There are se several I've visited in the UK, just incredibly moving. Like, there's one where every child is of immigrant background, and one child you could count as middle class, the rest all working class or unemployed parents. And wow, the standards of that school are great. And they've now got amazing entry level, uh, entry to Oxford and Cambridge, better than some what we call private schools. And the way you do it is you focus on the basics. And this is what I wish people in this country would do with the demagogues and the teaching unions. You know, at the time that this started in the UK, this thing, the teaching unions went crazy. But I always said, at that stage, one in five students leaving schools in Britain were functionally illiterate when they left. <laughs> functionally illiterate. If you're functionally illiterate when you leave school, you're going to be functionally illiterate throughout your whole life. And if you can't do basic subtracting and addition and you can't write, you just your life chances, your, your best chance in life has been taken from you. It's just a tragedy. And there are similar statistics across this country. So when people say things like, we've got to address multiracial whiteness, or we've got to address, you know, um, and they come up with this jargon, I say, teach, have you got the basics right? Have you got every American child in the optimal position of learning how to spell, learning how to read, learning how to subtract and add up, learning basic literacy skills, learning just all the basics. Have you done that yet? Because they talk as if they've nixed all of that. <laughs> they talk as if uh, the, the American school child leaves school in this country, you know, quoting Homer and whistling Stravinsky. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not the case. If that was the case, then maybe these obscure and, I think, highly damaging, uh, ill-thought-through non-theories we could play with. But wow, not in the meantime. Not in the meantime. And every parent knows that in this country. So if they could get the basics right, then I'd listen to them. Until then, I, want, I don't want them to give another damn address about uh, CRT or any other theory that doesn't work in theory and is hellish in practice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Douglas, for a wonderful presentation. I, I can tell the crowd agrees with me. We really enjoyed your insights. And he gave me a great springboard for our next event. The Show Me Institute will be hosting an event at noon on December 18th. You can go to our website to sign up for it. The presenter will be our Director of Research and Education Policy, Susan Pendergrass, who's going to be talking about our most recent project, it's Missouri School Rankings, which will give you the information about how in each school, in each school district, how the children are doing in math and English. And you will be very disappointed with what you see. But come and join. Learn more, because that's what we need to change the state. Again, thank you, Douglas. Thank you, News Talk, STL. Thank you, National Review Institute. And thank all of you for joining us this evening. <laughs>